Hello, my name is Nazir Khan from the Faculty of Civil Engineering Technology, and I will be demonstrating for you the construction of the shear force and bending moment diagrams of a simple beam. When we look at what we have here, is a simple beam, and you might ask yourself, why do we need to construct shear and bending moment diagram? It's for design purposes. It is for the sizing of beams. When we have uh, maximum shear force and maximum bending moment, we could then choose different types and orientation of beam, different material types, and different sizes of beam that will accommodate the load. So we have to examine the moment within the beam and the shear force within the beam. So that's the purpose of what we're doing. When we look at this simple diagram here, we have on the left hand side here, we have what we call a pin or hinge support. We ha then have a UDL, we have a point load, and then we have a roller support. UDL means uniformly distributed load. With the supports that we have here, they could be a representation of walls or so. And you notice the symbols for these supports are different. The symbols are different. This one is called a pin or hinge, and it is uh, represented by a horizontal and vertical reactant force. Horizontal and vertical reactant force. We'll see that right away. For the right-hand side, the roller support. This is unique uh, in its nature. The roller support is represented by one force, one reactant force, perpendicular to the base of it. So if this was oriented in the vertical direction where the roller was over here, you would have uh, a force acting that way. So it's uh, perpendicular to the base of it. The first thing that I have to do is place some guidelines here because we're going to have a, a stack of diagrams. Each, the next diagram is dependent on the previous diagram. Say for instance, if I didn't have a beam diagram, I couldn't construct uh, construct a free body diagram, which you'll see right away. Okay. We put a guideline at each location where you have a change of loading, a change of loading. We have right at this left hand side, we have the end of the beam and usually you put a, a, a guideline at that location. We also have a reactant force or two reactant force right there. So we're going to place a guideline. The end of the uniformly distributed load, I'm going to put a guideline and the point load guideline and on the right hand side where we have the reactant force for BY, we're going to have a guideline there. These guidelines are here because we're going to place a stack of diagrams, stack of them. First one that, that's going to happen is a free body diagram and if we didn't have again the simple beam uh, here we couldn't construct a free body diagram so the next diagram is dependent on the previous diagram and after the free body diagram we're going to do a deflected shape and we're going to do a little bit of an explanation there we're going to do a load diagram we're going to do shear force diagram and then finally a bending moment diagram and the shear force diagram the maximum deviation we're going to pick that number off and same with the bending moment diagram so let's go and create our FBD. Free body diagram means that you have cut a part of a structure away from the original structure and you have replaced the supports with forces. In this case the supports are a pin support and a roller support. Pin support is associated with two forces, one horizontal, one vertical. Roller support in this case it is one vertical force, BY. With the requirements of an FBD, you're drawing it with a straight edge. You have to have all of the loading involved. If you don't have magnitudes, you're going to label them. You're going to have dimension. Well, I'm not going to repeat the dimensions because they're right up here, and that's one of the reasons for stacking the, the diagrams, too. You don't have to repeat certain types of information. They're right there. Okay, so I have my dimensions in here. I have all of my magnitudes that I need. If you notice for AX, which is this reactant force right there, I already have a magnitude of zero. The reason for this is that we don't have any horizontal component to cause a reaction, to cause a reaction from this particular support. Okay? If we had an angular force, then the component would cause a reaction. We would have 
a magnitude other than zero for this. Okay. The next thing to do is to go and calculate the mag magnitude of AY and BY. We have to calculate the magnitude of AY and BY. To do that, we have three equilibrium equations available to us. And those equations are summation forces in the x direction is equal to zero, summation forces in the y direction is equal to zero, and summation moments is equal to zero. Let's go and look at the calculation for AY and BY. Okay. I have placed on the simple beam, I've placed a point load representing the UDL or the uniformly distributed load. We know that every meter that we go, out, go over or on the base of it, on the width of it, every meter is going to be 7 kilonewtons. So we have 2 meters here. 7 times 2 is 14. I'm going to put it through the centroid of that particular UDL. Okay. It will help me with my calculation. It is not part of the FBD. It just help me with my calculation. I'm going to do moments about point A. It will eliminate the most amount of unknown force at that point. And I'm going to have a moment that's created by the UDL. I'm going to have a moment that's created by the point force. And I'm going to have a moment that is created by the reactant at B. Okay, so we're going to have three moments. We're going to have three sets of terms. Terms are separated by minus and plus signs. So we're going to have three sets. The equation is summation moments about point A is equal to zero and counterclockwise rotation is considered to be positive. That's what the other is telling us. Okay, let's go and create the magnitude. Remember that the mo uh, a moment is force times perpendicular distance, right? So we have the magnitude of the force right there, seven times two, which is 14, times the perpendicular distance. Well, that perpendicular distance happened to be true the centroid of that shape. So that will be 2 divided by 2, which will give you 1. We can't remember, we can't forget, I should say, that the rotation is negative. This is going to create a negative rotation about point A. So therefore, we have a minus right in front here. When we look at the point load right here, the point load right here, again, we have a negative rotation. It's going clockwise. It's going clockwise. And we have a perpendicular distance to that line of action. That line of action is 3 plus or 2 plus 3, which will give you 5. So minus 12 times 5 will give you minus 60. We also have a moment that's going to be created by BY here. It's going to go that direction. And that particular moment has a perpendicular distance of 2, 5, 9. So 9 times BY in the positive direction. When you crunch those numbers, you're going to have 8.222 kilonewton as your reactant force. Okay, it's 8.222. I have carried an extra digit here because my final answer, I round off to three sig figs. The intermediate answers, I just keep a guard digit so that I have accurate answers. Okay, this force, when I write a force, I have the magnitude, we have all four co components of a force, magnitude, the direction is vertical, the sense is up, and point of application is point B. So we have magnitude, direction, sense, point of application. Okay, let's go and calculate the force for AY now. I cannot reuse my equilibrium equation for one scenario. Okay, I cannot reuse the equilibrium. I've done summation moments. I cannot use summation moments about point B and solve for AY. I have to choose one of the other two equilibrium equation. And the appropriate equation to choose is summation forces in the Y direction is equal to zero. And of course, we have going up is positive. Okay, going up is positive. When we look at uh, forces going up, we have AY going up, that's a positive. We have the 14 kilonewton going down, which is a negative, and we have 12 kilonewton going down, a negative again. And we have a value, a magnitude for BY now 
and that's going up positive crunch the numbers you have 1778 kilonewtons acting up so now we have all of our magnitudes that we need for FBD okay again my final answer I'll run off the three significant digits the other answers I'm gonna carry a guard digit let's go and construct a deflected shape diagram now okay the deflected shape diagram is constructed from the beam diagram it is the red line here showing the way that the beam would actually deflect under loading under loading okay it's a bit exaggerated for demonstration purposes but it is the way that the beam the shape that the beam would actually take under loading so this is it right there we have a beam that's pinned at two location and it has forces acting down in between those two location it will cause this type of shape on the upper part I have a C and the lower part I have a T the C represent compression the T represent tension now let's consider a wooden beam okay if I were to take one fiber on the upper half of the wooden beam on the upper half of the wooden beam a fiber right there for it to assume the shape what has to happen to that fiber it has to be compressed it has to be compressed so the forces must be acting towards the member the member is being the fiber now and when you look at the lower half of the beam the lower half of the beam the fiber has to be stretched so the force has to be acting away it has to pull it apart to stretch it and anytime that we have forces acting towards a member it is compression and force acting away from the member it's tension okay so that's how we decide which side is tension and compression also the dotted line could be considered the neutral axis which you don't have any tension or compression there that's a separating line between tension and compression okay so you could consider it the neutral axis in that respect so we have um, a deflected shape one other thing about the deflected shape the internal moment in the beam always act if you were to put a moment it's more like a, a torque it's a rotation you would put the arrowhead towards compression it depends on where you cut the beam okay the open end is where the the moment will bleed out let's go and look at um, the load diagram the one thing that you have to remember about the load diagram all positive force which are forces acting up goes above your datum line the datum line is right there again it is the darker black line all forces from your shear force diagram that's acting up will go above all forces acting down we go below the datum and that's the only thing that you have to remember if we were to look at our forces we have the reactant AY acting up I placed it above the datum I have the UDL right there uniformly distributed load right across that area it is a negative load it's acting down okay so I put it below my datum I have my point load right there and that's acting down below and then the final one by acting up I've replaced the actual labels of the reactants with the actual magnitude or the values of them so I don't need uh, to, to maintain the labels at this point okay that's all there is to a load diagram as you could see we went from the beam diagram to the free body diagram we needed the beam diagram the information from there to actually uh, draw the free body diagram then we went to the load diagram also we needed the information from the free body diagram to draw the load diagram okay let's go and construct our shear force diagram now and when we look at the shear force diagram fairly simple concept again we're gonna start from left going to the right side and we are going to use the load diagram to construct it we have the load diagram here we're going to start from left again 
we are increased by 1778 right at that point so I have a direct increase of 1778 kilonewtons between this point and this point right here between the left side and the end of the UDL I have a uniformly distributed load so it's nice and even it's gonna be a straight line section however as you go from left to right it's increasing so it is going to be a decreasing situation here okay it's going to, you're gonna go from 17.78 kilonewton you're gonna reduce by 14 kilonewton which is the total magnitude of that so you're gonna go down to 3.78 I'm gonna just take 14 away from 17.78 I'm gonna get 3.78 right at that point okay from that point if I were to look at my load diagram from this point here there's no influence there is no influence until we get to the 12 kilonewton force so then on my shear force diagram that remains constant it remains a horizontal line and then when it gets to this point here it's influenced by the 12 kilonewton force which knocks it down to the negative side actually I'm gonna take 3.78 minus 12 I'm gonna get minus 8.222 okay so I've gone to the negative sign side of uh, the shear force diagram I'm not going to be influenced by any force in between here until I get to the end so I stay constant and then when I get to the end I'm bumped up by 8.22 and this is important we started at 0 and we ended at 0 we could feel fairly confident that we have actually done whatever is done in here well so we close we have a check okay it doesn't mean that uh, the moment diagram is going to check if the moment diagram does not close to zero that means that our reactants are in calculated incorrectly okay the next thing before we could go and construct our bending moment diagram we have to calculate the area under the shear force diagram and that area represent a moment okay when we look at force times distance that would be a moment in this first area here we have a trapezoid we have a base two parallel bases right there and we have a distance in between them so I'm going to calculate that area with the trapezoid formula 17.78 plus 3.78 divided by 2 which is the average of the base times the distance between them the the two bases which is 2 meters so you don't see the 2 meters very well here but when you crunch the numbers it equals to 2156 and that would be kilonewton meter so you have gone from force times distance kilonewton meter so the area under the, the shear force diagram is a moment and in this case it's a positive moment let's go and look at the rectangular shape now we have 3.78 right at that point we have a distance of 3 meters so 3.78 kilonewton times 3 meters will give you 1134 kilonewton meter again a positive moment okay when we look at the last rectangle that we have here the last rectangle it is a minus rectangle because we have a minus force and we have a distance of 4 so to calculate that will be minus 8.22 kilonewton times 4 meters will give you 32 or minus 32.88 kilonewton meter okay that's the number right in there so we have all the information that we need for constructing the bending moment diagram the other thing that we have to remember when we have rectangles on the shear force diagram which we have one and two those are straight line on the bending moment diagram when we have triangles or trapezoid which we do have here that's going to be a curve but there's different curves if you have um, different orientation of the triangle it represents a different type of curve if you have negative area or a negative moment that's a different type of curve you have uh, concave and convex curve that happens with that and I'll show you a, 
a fairly easy way to remember these curves. All right. Let's go and look at uh, the Kahn's bending moment bug. You won't find this in any textbook. Okay. The, uh, gives, it gives the shape of the curve for the bending moment diagram for triangles and trapezoids. So it gives the shape of the, the bending moment diagram. These are the shapes that I'm speaking about, these curves here for triangles and trapezoid. The shape of the shear force diagram tri for triangles and trapezoids are converted into curves on the bending moment diagram. So when we look at this, we have a diamond really and it's uh, separated into four equal parts we have the upper part of the diamond are represented by areas of triangles and those are positive area the lower part of this is negative area as you could see for the positive areas we have here depending on the orientation of the area we have here a concave rising up okay it's rising for the other positive orientation we have a convex rising up convex rising up when we look at uh, the negative areas for the first orientation that we have here we have a convex falling and for the next one we have a concave falling okay so these fairly s simple way to remember this when you are on evaluations and stuff like that and you need to remember these shape it's just a bug it's separated into four you start from the left hand side you have the whisker of the bug and you have the back leg of the bug okay fairly easy let's go and construct our bending moment diagram now I've placed the bug right at that location. You don't have to do this on your work. This is just for me to get the appropriate shape for this particular uh, trapezoid shape when I do the bending moment diagram. As you could see, we know that we're going to have a curve right in there. My triangle is positive, first of all. It's a positive moment and I have an orientation where my right angle is right there. That is the shape that I'm looking for right there. So I know I have a convex rising, a convex rising. How much is it going to rise from zero? The amount of the moment, right? So I'm going to put my moment right there. I'm going to draw a convex rising up to it. The next shape that comes into play happens to be a rectangle. And that again is a positive moment. It's a positive moment. It's 11.34 kilonewton meter. From my 2156, I'm going to rise again. And when I add those two numbers, I'm going to get 3278 kilonewton meter. Okay. From that point, I have a negative moment. And that negative moment happens to be exactly matching what my magnitude here is which is positive so I know I'm gonna go back to zero and because it's a rectangle I am going to go in a straight line to zero I could feel now confident that all my work that I've done previously is correct everything is uh, going very well let's go and pick out our V max and our M max V max is the maximum shear force and I'm gonna round my final answer off to three significant digits when I look at how to pick off my Vmax, it's the maximum deviation from my datum, maximum deviation from my datum, okay, whether it's positive, in this case it is positive, or negative. I'm going to record it as an absolute value number, 17.8 kilonewtons, okay. Again, the same, same rules apply to the bending moment diagram, the maximum deviation. If this was happened to be and the minus sign or the minus side then I would just record it as a positive again and that maximum deviation you could see it right there 32.8 it becomes kilonewton meter okay this is all that I have for you
and I hope that uh, it explains how to construct the shear force and bending moment diagram. Have fun with it. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Nazir Khan from the Faculty of Civil Engineering Technology. In this session, I will be demonstrating how to construct the bending stress diagram. Now, the previous two videos of a series of three, which this being the third video, uh, demonstrate how to construct the FBD, the deflected shape, the load diagram, the shear force diagram, and the bending moment diagram. And that's uh, the shear force and the bending moment is what I have on screen right now. Okay. We need some information uh, from, from this diagram to actually continue. When we look at this, we have the shear force diagram right here. And the maximum shear force is 17.8 picked off right there. And we have the maximum moment or bending moment right there, 32.8, which is picked off right there. We need this value to actually calculate the bending stress. To calculate the bending stress, we need to use this formula here. The formula saying bending stress in MPA is equal to maximum moment in Newton per millimeter times the Y bar in millimeters and the inertia value right here is going to be in millimeters to the fourth. This is the inertia value for the complex shape. When we look at uh, the moment, we already picked it off from the previous diagram, so we have that already these two values we don't have and the formula for calculating the Y bar is right there. Now if the cross-section of the structural member is a symmetrical cross-section you just need to take the height and divide it by 2. However if it's a non-symmetrical uh, section we have to use this formula right here. For the inertia value this is the inertia for the complex shape. In here we have the inertia for the simple shapes and it's summation of inertia of simple shape plus the summation of ADY squared and that will give you the inertia of the complex shape right there. Okay. Let's look at the cross section of our structural member. We could see that we don't have a symmetrical shape because if I cut it right across here we don't have two equal halves so we don't have a symmetrical shape in the y direction so we have to go and calculate the y bar using this formula right here. Okay. To do that, we're going to make a reference to the bottom. So all of the centroid of these simple shapes, the individual shapes, are located right approximately at these locations. And to get the Y bar for, or the DY, I should say, for the Y bar, it is referenced to the base of the cross section, to the base of the cross section. So for shape uh, four, shape 4 right here, if I want to get to the neutral axis of shape 4 from the base, it's half the height. 50 divided by 2 will give you 25. If I want to go to shape 3, uh, I want to locate the centroid of shape 3 from the base, it's going to be 600 right there, divided by 2 will give, get me to the halfway point, but then I have to add the base of 50. I have to add the height of shape 4 of 50 it will give me 350. 350. For shape number 2, half of the height is 25 plus 600. 625 plus 50 will give me 675 right there. And for shape number 1, I'm going to go all the way to the top, the whole height of the cross section, and I'm just going to subtract half of the height of shape 1 which is 25 and I'm gonna go get uh, 625 so I have all of my dy's right there the areas are fairly simple to calculate when we look at uh, 400 times 50 
5 fourths 20, so we'll have 20,000. 20, Fairly easy calculation. Nice numbers to work with. I'm going to set up the, the Y bar information in a table form, and I have done that. All the areas are listed here. I have shape 1 to 4, and I have the Y bar corresponding Y bars right here. The only thing I have to do is multiply these to get my ADY. Okay, The ADY, when I summate it, this value is right up in the numerator, and summation of area is the denominator, and that'll give me my value for my Y bar. Again, it's demonstrated right here. You just drop the 3, 0, drop 2 more 0. You have 425 as your Y bar. Now, remember that this Y bar is from the base of the cross-section. It is from the base of the cross-section, so let's take a look at that. I placed the centroid in because we're going to need that. And we have 425 from the base to the neutral axis. This is the centroid of the complex shape. To get from the neutral axis to the top edge of the cross-section, I'm going to take the whole height and minus 425. Now the whole height will be 600, 750 minus 425 will give you 325. Okay, again, 6, 750 minus 425 will give you 325. So I have the distance from the neutral axis to the two outer edge. I need those uh, Y bars for my calculation of my stress. Also need the DY. Now remember I mentioned that the DYs are not the same. The DY for the Y bar calculation was based on the base or it, it is uh, from the bottom of the shape. The DYs for in, in inertia calculation it is from the neutral axis as your baseline. The neutral axis is your baseline. So I need that little distance in there. I need the distance from the neutral axis to there. So the neutral axis is really my base point, baseline and reference point of, uh, all in one. To calculate this particular little area here, I have the height of 425 from the base. If I have the, from the base to this point here, I could certainly calculate this little distance in here. How do I get this height? I calculated it before, but let's do it again. We have 600 for this uh, center member. Divided by 2, you will get from here to that point. Add the 50. So we'll have 350. 350 from 4, 25 will give you 75. Okay. Let's go and do another one. We're going to go and get the Y bar, the Y bar from this centroid to the neutral axis. The only thing I have to do is take 425 minus one half the height here, which is 25, you get 400. Okay. And likewise with the upper half, the upper half. Let's go to the centroid of shape one. We have 325 to the top end minus 25, which is half the height, so I get 300. And we have 325 to the top end, minus 50, minus 25, minus 75 from that, you get 250. Okay, so we have all the Y bars that we need to do our calculation of our inertia value. I've placed it in table form again, the base and the height of each one of the shapes. Okay, shape 4, shape 3, shape 2, shape 1. Okay, when we look at the DYs, here they are corresponding dy's and let's look at the inertia value because that comes into play right here we need that number really we need the summation of inertia which is right there for rectangular shape the inertia is bh cubed divided by 12 for simple shapes for sh simple shape when we want uh, complex shape we have to use this big formula but nevertheless we have all rectangular shapes and we have base times height cubed divided by 12. I've defined the base and height of each one of the shapes right here. So I'm going to take the base times 50 cubed divided by 12. It'll give me 4,166,667. Okay, and that is what I do all the way down. I'm going to summate that and that value will come right here in this formula. Okay, 
I'm going to take my dy for shape 1 and I'm going to square it because that's what the formula is a dy squared you could see the dy is squared right there square this multiply it by the area in this case 5 for is 20,000 multiply 300 squared by 20,000 you're going to get 1 billion 800 million as your answer okay and another one I'm going to take 250 and square it and we're going to multiply it by 25,000 and it should give me 1,562,500,000 and likewise all the way down. When I summate that, I'm going to have summation of ADY squared as 7,531,250,000 and that value will come right in here. Okay, that value comes right in there. This one is there. When I add up the two value, algebraically add them, I will have 8,445,833,333 millimeters to the fourth. Millimeters to the fourth. Now I have all the variables that I need, all the quantities that I need to apply them to my stress formula. Stress in MPA is equal to moment newton per millimeter times my y bar and I'm going to have two y bars because I have two distances from uh, to the outer edge from my neutral axis and I have my inertia value of the complex shape. The y bar above the uh, neutral axis is 325 the y bar below it is 425 and we've picked off from our bending moment diagram 32.8 kilonewton meter which we need to apply right in there. But the units are, are not right. The units are not right. We have to change this uh, kilonewton meter to newton millimeter. And to change kilonewton to newton, I'm going to multiply by a thousand. Meters to millimeters, I'm going to multiply by another thousand. When I multiply a thousand by a thousand, I get a million. So when I take 32.8 kilonewton meter, multiply it by 10 to the 6, which is a million, I'm going to have newton per millimeter. Then I'm going to multiply that by millimeters. I'm going to have newton per millimeter squared in the numerator and millimeter to the fourth in the denominator. The millimeter squared will count, uh, cancel out with the millimeter to the fourth and the denominator will be millimeter squared. So I'm ending up with newton divided by millimeter squared, which is MPA, which is MPA. Okay, when I crunch the numbers on this, I have 1.26 MPA for the upper part above my neutral axis as my stress. Okay, the outer edge will have 1.26 MPA stress. For the lower half, I have to run the formula again. The only thing that changes from this formula to this one is that my Y bar has changed. Okay, that's the only thing has changed. When I crunch the numbers again, not a significant increase, but it is an increase and it has to be calculated we have 1.65 MPA. Now we are ready to actually go and construct our stress diagram. When we look at our cross section, it's right there, it's not part of the stress diagram. I'm going to put in the neutral axis and that is not part of the stress diagram either. But it certainly demonstrates how to draw the stress diagram. This is actually the stress diagram here. We have cut the beam right there and the forces will bleed out forces will bleed out we know that right along the neutral axis the forces change from tension to compression we know that we know that from our calculation the upper half has 1.26 MPA of stress and the lower 1.65 MPA when we create our stress diagram you notice the larger the smaller number has a shorter distance from the cut edge and the larger one has a larger distance from the cut edge it doesn't have to be to scale but you should have shorter longer like this the other thing that we have to realize is that the stress from the outer edge decreases to the neutral axis to zero okay the neutral axis is where you change over from tension to compression so it comes to zero there 
and then it goes back out it starts to increase in a linear form in a linear form the other thing that we have to determine is how to place our arrowheads for stress let's go to our deflected shape when we look at our deflected shape here we did this in video one we see that our deflected shape was like this compression is on top tension is on the bottom <clears throat> the arrowhead always act towards compression and because we cut the beam and we are demonstrating the bleeding out of the forces on the right hand side we have the right shape here so we could put that this is not part of it but it helps us in placing our arrowheads for our stress when we have arrowheads um, or forces acting towards a member that is compression it's indicated by the C and when we have them acting away from the member that is tension which it indicates by the T this uh, basically is the, the stress diagram not very complicated you have to have the neutral axis you have to have the stresses you have to have the arrows okay this particular rotation this moment rotation here is not necessary this cross section is not necessary but it was necessary for me to show you the relationship between them and it makes it easier to explain that's everything that I have to do for this section.